did not get to see my picture uh, in your Navigate folder. Instead, you saw something far more important, and that is my car. It's all about destination. It's all about understanding uh, where we're going and how we're going to get there. And so I thought it appropriate. You really didn't need to see my face. But you do need to see the vehicle that aligns us to understanding discipleship. And so I'd like to start by just taking you. Uh, we only have an hour, and so I am going to go pretty quickly. Uh, the layout of this breakout workshop is I'm going to share some things with you, and then I'm going to give you time to work with uh, someone around you. That could be someone from your church, or it actually could be someone that you don't know. Uh, the possibilities are that you might be able to hear something uh, that you did not hear before and that you can take that nugget uh, home with you. But you also might want the, uh, the pleasure of working with someone in your church, in your context, to uh, ferret out and to digest some of these nuggets that we're going to get. When I look at the Gospel of Mark and I see one of the teachings uh, that Jesus gave us, I'm troubled. Can I tell you, I'm just troubled. Let me read it to you. It's from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. A farmer went out to scatter seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where the soil was shallow. They sprouted up immediately because the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it scorched the plants, and they dried up because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked the seeds, and they produced nothing. Other seed fell into good soil and bore fruit. Upon growing and increasing, the seed produced, in one case, a yield of 30 to 1, in another case, a yield of 60 to 1, in another case, a yield of 100 to 1. And Jesus said, whoever has ears to listen should pay attention. I'm troubled. I want to listen. As a pastor, I want to listen, Lord, so what do we do with that seed? How can we be fruitful and faithful with the seed, the word of God in which you've given us? And how can we as churches make a difference in people's lives? What is our discipleship pathway? And how does that discipleship pathway align with ministry? And so that's our topic this morning. And so I'd like to introduce you to my car. If you're lucky enough to go out in the parking lot before I leave, you're going to see this cute little thing. It is a Fiat Pop convertible, and it gets me to where I'm going. Now, I always saw a car as a tool, and so I would have the cheapest. I've had a Pacer station wagon. I've had a Vega. I have had them all, and they've been terrible looking cars. But it didn't matter to me because it was the destination that was most critical and most important. And so when it was time to get a new car, my husband said, could you get a car that you could enjoy the ride? Could you get a car that you really like and that you could smile when you're in the car and you just wouldn't always see as just a way to get from point A to point B? And so this is the car, the sweet ride that I have. Now, when I'm using my car, I am not a techie. And so when I'm in the car, I turn on the ignition. It is an Italian car, and so sometimes the date changes on me, the time changes on me, and I have no clue how to set it. I get in my car because my car gets me to where I am going. That's the important part. But folks, sometimes I'm not attentive to the needs of my car. And so there are times when I get in and I say, well, the ignition works, so the car is good, right? And the car runs, and so I'm able to, to get going, and every once in a while I need brakes. And as long as the brakes work, then I'm good there. What I don't tend to understand and be attentive to is that sometimes there are small changes in the steering of my car. And so it starts to shimmy and vibrate a little bit. 
Also, there's this uneven sound. As my car is going down the road, I'll, I'll hear different things, and I'll wonder, is something wrong with my car? And then, if I look outside of my car, I can see, perhaps, when I look at the tires, that there might be a problem, because the tread on my tires might be uneven. Often people say, if I ever get snagged in a pothole, I will never find my way out. And I always tell them, but every tire will be involved. So what I want you to think about when we're talking about alignment in ministry is that alignment can be fixed. But if I wait until I have some noticeable things happening in my car, I've waited too long, haven't I? And so we're here today because what we want to do is make sure that we can align the ministry of our church with our discipleship pathway before we get going so far down the road and we wonder why things aren't working. So alignment refers to the deep commitment of the church to the mission and vision of the church. Now, you've heard this before, right? This is not new. I hope it's not new to you. But I'm going to pray right now that it becomes brand new. Because you and I, as leaders in our churches, need to see this with brand new spiritual eyes. So let's pray. Oh, holy God, spirit of the living God, we who have heard these phrases over and over again, and sometimes, Lord, it's like the alignment of our car. We become so accustomed to the verbiage that we forget the meaning. And so we are asking, we are surrendering here in this room to be open to the Holy Spirit's word and power in our life that we might hear brand new and that we might have a vision for when we return in our cars to our home context to be fruitful, to be fruitful in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. In ministry, if you get nothing out of today's breakout session, is please know the why of alignment. Everything hinges on the why. Always ask the question, why are we doing this? Matthew 28 gives us the why. We are to go out and make disciples. We are to teach and to baptize. This is a process. So the question is, is the mission and vision clearly owned and articulated in your context? And I'm going to put you on the spot. Will you turn to the person next to you and will you answer that question? Is the mission and the vision of your context clearly owned, and is it articulated? In other words, if someone would come into your church and say, what's the mission and the vision of this church, will they get the answer that you want them to get? Just share that very quickly. Yes or no? Okay, folks. I hope you weren't too surprised. Now the next question that I bring to you is, how do you know? I mean, if you've answered, yes, the mission and the vision is articulated, no, the mission and the vision is not articulated, the next question is, well, how would you know? How would you know? Because again, are we so used to saying, sure, we know the mission, sure, we know the vision, but the fruits aren't low-hanging. The fruits aren't there as evidence that we have a clear understanding in our heads, we've connected it to our hearts, and now the evidence is in our ministry. So here's the process. Intentional awareness and inspection. 
See, first you have to see, and there are the no factors of alignment. We have to be willing to ask questions. We have to gather and analyze statistics and trends. And we have to have an intentional awareness, and hear this carefully, of seeing without blinders. When I first went to my church six years ago, it was July 1st, and I noticed that there was a snow shovel right in front of the front door of the church with a bucket of salt. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why we needed a snow shovel in July and salt. Can I tell you something? As I left my church this morning, do you know what's in front of the door of the church? There's a snow shovel. But I had stopped seeing it. And can I dare say, think about your context. Can I dare say that there are things that you no longer see? You no longer acknowledge that you know. There's not this intentional awareness of what might be happening because you've been there long enough. What do we do about that? There's also this hearing that we have to be open to when we want to align ministry with our discipleship pathway, and that is we have to be willing to get feedback. We need to be willing to listen and collect internal information. How many of you just love, you pastors in the room, just say, well, how was the sermon this week? How many of you love to ask that question? There are questions that sometimes we don't want to know how our sermon was. There are questions we don't want to know because if we know it, then we're going to have to do something about it. And so there's this internal, let's collect some really maybe tough information that we need to hear, and then let's go out in our community and let's collect information that the community has of this perception of what, what and who our church is. And then the third one is feeling. And I'm not talking about feeling as an emotion here, but a movement of the spirit. So in aligning our ministry this is paramount. It has to be preceded. It has to be flooded. It has to be encased with prayer. Prayer precedes getting in the car. Yes, it has to. Again, you might hear this and say, oh, sure. How many of you have existing prayer teams that are praying for the mission and the vision of the church? Low-hanging fruit. Prayer has to be past, present, and future oriented. And I believe that prayer has to be every single Sunday that we need to be praying for our discipleship pathway and process. We need to be praying for our mission and vision. It has to soak so deeply within us that we leak out who we are as a church. We also need discernment. This is affirmation or confirmation, and this happens at a leadership level. This is a case that as leader day or once you get home to on the right side of your PowerPoint, in your context, what are your obstacles for making disciples? What are they? Just name them. No one else has to see them. What's the vulnerabilities? What are those things that are at risk? If you would move ahead, if you would cut, if you would eliminate, if you would rebirth, what's the cost? What's the possibility of outsourcing? And what's the urgency? What's the urgency? If I don't move ahead, if our church doesn't move ahead to become fruitful, to align ministry with, with making disciples for Jesus Christ, what? is the cost, and how much urgency do we have? This is almost a come to Jesus moment. As I go out and I coach churches, very often I have to say, folks, I'm not judging you. It's not a, a scale of one to 10. Just I need to know how important is this. Do you wake up at night thinking with your heart breaking that we haven't seen a new believer in years? Does that trouble you? Is there an urgency that we have to do something different? 
Because what we're doing right now is not producing or growing disciples. So ministry inspection is the arrangement of all ministries. It's the arrangement of staff around the same process. This is what ministry inspection is not. It's not just passion limited to one ministry area. We have that, right? I own the room. I claim the space. I have the resources. I gather the volunteers. And I own the calendar. That's hijacking. It's hijacking ministry. It's more costly not to address misalignment than to ignore it. So, your soul-searching questions. In your context where you are, does program come before purpose or purpose before program? Does direction, does direction come before destination or are your eyes always on the prize, as Paul said? And it's on destination. And there might be very many different directions to get there. How many of you got a little lost coming here? Oh, thank you. I saw more farmland in the last five minutes of my trip than I cared to see because I did not put in the destination. I put in Lewisburg High School. I didn't put in the exact address. Now, you draw the implications to our spiritual context. If we're not really, really clear about where we are going, what our destination is, oh, friends, we will wander. And sometimes we'll get so frustrated in the wandering that we'd say, you know what? I'm just turning around, and I'm going home. I'm going home. And Jesus told us, never, never, never look back. Always look forward. I have plans for you. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and to give you a future. That's a destination. We never, never can lose sight of that. And then the third one, do we esteem ourselves as faithful? Or do we want to say, whatever it takes, I want to be fruitful. Now, in each of your existing ministry areas, here are just concrete, hard and easy questions to ask. Why are we doing? So I want you to think about a ministry area. Just pick anyone. Just think about it in your head so you can focus. And the question that you're going to be asking yourself is, why are we doing this? See, many times in our context, we want to say, what are we doing? How are we doing? How much will it cost to do what we're doing? And none of those questions get asked until the answer to the most important question. Why are we doing this? What's the intended outcome of the ministry? What's our destination for this ministry? And is it a holy scriptural destination? Who's the target of this ministry that we're trying to reach? Is this ministry reaching insiders or outsiders? And then lastly, how will we measure? How are you going to measure fruitfulness? Bishop Schnazy tells us, that in each of our ministry contexts, if we want to be fruitful, we better look at these five practices. Our ministries ought to be inclusive, that we have an intentional faith development, that we have an understanding, as organic as it may be at any level, but we have an understanding, how do we make a disciple, and then how do we grow a disciple, and how does that disciple then reach out to make another disciple? He says we better have some risk-taking mission and service. Your hands better be active in articulating your discipleship. 
I so understand and just acknowledge Ken when he said, as a believer comes to know Christ and grows with Christ, service just comes. Can I also tell you that the opposite is true? You get someone in your church, you take them on a mission trip, they don't know Christ. And you will find that the opposite is true, is get someone serving outside in the community, inside the church, and you're intentional about the why that they're serving, you will see them grow to be a disciple. It's a beautiful process. There's no greater joy for me than to have someone who comes to the church or that I encounter in the community and we're able to share Christ and they come to know Christ. Do you know who I want to be with every day of that week? I want to be with that new believer. They just charge me up. I get so excited because I see the raw love of God working in their lives. They're not complacent. They're really risk-taking, aren't they? Like, they'll just go up and tell anybody. I remember in eighth grade when I came to know Jesus, I was so excited. I was raised Catholic, and God was a really scary God to me. And so I came to know Christ, and I would just go up and I'd say, William, can I tell you about Christ? I'm just so excited. You just need to know Jesus. Now, I imagine that I turned a lot of people off. I imagine that in that time, they probably said, well, there's a Jesus freak. Can I also tell you, I'd pray for some of us to be Jesus freaks again. Yeah. Maybe we need a little bit of the radical risk-taking. Hey, I want to tell my story. Because what I know in the context of my ministry and what I know going from church to church is we as United Methodists are pretty frightened to share our story because we're more worried about me than we are about the. And Jesus says, we love someone because they're hurting and they're looking for someone and will you be the bridge to bring them to me or are you going to be worried about this? Boy, could we stand some radicalness and some risk. We also need extravagant generosity. Does your budget drive your ministry plan? Or does your ministry plan drive your budget? And then we need passionate worship. We need to get real serious in our discipleship plan, and I'm so excited that Ken and Mike are going to show us how to worship this afternoon, and then take that worship apart and, and, and teach us how each piece of this worship is really discipleship. It's just going to be amazing for us to really see. But we need worship that speaks about what we're about. And we need radical hospitality. They've done a great job in welcoming us here. As they should. Because we are the body of Christ. And if the body of Christ cannot understand what a heartfelt radical hospitality looks like, how will we ever convey it? I was in one of uh, the smaller churches doing a, a workshop, and I walked in, and there are maybe four or five ladies. And I looked, and I said, good morning. I said, morning. They're making coffee and working, and I went over, and, and I, I just drink one kind of tea. And, and so I said, might I have a, just a cup of water? Because I'd like to make a cup of tea. And she said, sure. And she looked at me, and she said, what kind of tea do you drink? Hook. And I said, well, let me tell you, I just love this tea. And I struck up a conversation over tea. Was I really interested in getting her to drink my tea? I happen to think it's great tea. But I was more interested in establishing a relationship with this woman. I sat down, and as we were getting ready for the meeting to start, this, a grandma was sitting there, and she said, I got this new phone, and my grandchildren are trying to tell me. They say that there's a flashlight on this phone. I can't imagine how there could be a flashlight on this phone, but they say a flashlight is on this phone. And I said, well, what kind of phone do you have? And she showed me, and she said, do you know? I said, well, I don't know because I don't have the same phone, but let's sit together and let's discover Am I talking to your heart? 
Is every chance, every conversation, is it just an opportunity for us to bring them a little closer to Jesus? When you stop and you get gas, is it an opportunity that you could bless somebody in just a, a small way? That's discipleship. That's alignment, is when first our lives are aligned and we're hot off the press for Jesus. We're just ready to do whatever it takes in our own personal lives. And then we're in the body of Christ. And corporately we say, whatever it takes, we'll rebirth, we'll eliminate, we'll tweak. But we want to be sure that we're obedient and that we're fruitful. And so if you need somewhat of a formula that you can take back to your church, you take your vision and you take your discipleship pathway, and then you integrate alignment into it, and I guarantee you, you will see fruit. Because my God is faithful. My God was, my God is, and my God will be. And so if you're not seeing fruit, you call me. You call me. That's how sure that I won't be inundated with calls because I know who God is, and I hope you do too. So your discipleship process is embedded in every ministry, moving the whole church in the same direction. Now, you know what this means? Very practically, it means that you need to allow some yeses in your church, and it also means that you need to have some noes too. So at my church, the discipleship process looks like this. It's certainly not perfect, but our discipleship process is plug in, charge up, and share and shine. And we understand it's not churchy words, but we're not in a community that we're really attracting churchy people. Our target is we want to attract people who may not understand Jesus and may not understand church. And so plug in, charge up, share and shine is our discipleship process. When you have vision and discipleship, I things change. Being a part of the um, team here at Middlesex since we started our math. Uh, we, is there any way we can hear this? I can actually just put the mic. I can put the mic to it. So while we're pulling up this video, let me give you the backdrop uh, for this video. And that is that uh, nine years ago, uh, Middle Section United Methodist Church embarked on what was called then the Matthew 28 process and simplified structure. We've been at it now for nine years. But the last two years, we have had a holy discontent. We have a mission and a vision and we realized that God wanted us to go deeper because disciples never arrive. Disciples always grow. And so we embarked on a process in which we looked at our vision and we discerned and we asked God, what is our next faithful and fruitful step? And so our leadership went away after much talking and spent a weekend where they prayed and, and we discerned and and they really started to dig in, and this vision arose that we were to be alive in Christ in our community, so our community would be alive in Christ. Now, that might just sound like a great statement, and, and any of these statements would just sound good until you put meat on it. But what we realized is that we had some partnerships, some intentional and some God-driven partnerships that were very organic, that were happening in our community because we were outward focused. Can you all hear that? Okay, so perhaps they can hear it just from there. So can you just start it over again? Or just hang on for me. And so um, the last two weeks, we have actually uh, cast that vision out into the church. Our children's director, we had our community partners there and then some of our staff there. The community partners were going to tell us how they saw us being a partner uh, for fruitful ministry within the community. And then our staff was actually sharing with the church how that was being realized, how God was already going.
going ahead of us and shaping. Who you're going to hear from is our children's director. And she relates this about how discipleship needs to be very loose and vision needs always to be assessed and evaluated. Listen in. I have the pleasure of being a part of the um, team here at Middlesex since we started our Matthew 28 process, I think about eight or nine years ago. And our annual extravaganza was one of the first things that was born out of that. Um, perfect example of how something that is really successful and really awesome um, at some point might not be fulfilling your exact mission. So that event, which a lot of you were a part of here at the church for years and years, just kept getting bigger and bigger, and it did an amazing job of um, helping us to be more well-known in the community for people saying, oh, that church, they're the one that does that cool event um, and invites us all in. Um, but as each year, uh, Danielle and I would kind of talk about it afterwards, and we felt like it was not fulfilling our mission as much as we wanted to because it had gotten so big and so successful and was so similar to some of the other events that um, families could be a part of in the community. So we were noticing that we would have like these huge lines for every activity and we kept trying to add more and more activities so that we could, you know, personally interact with the people that came and that became harder and harder. So this was kind of one of the first times that we took a big shift and there's been other things in the um, church. Little Lights is one example of successful program that then fulfilled what we had hoped for it and it was time to step away and try something new. So our idea of doing these neighborhood egg hunts that were smaller um, and a little bit simpler, but gave us that opportunity to really interact with people um, and really show them Christ's love by coming to them. First of all, that's kind of huge, right? Who comes to you, like right into your neighborhood and brings everything with them and sets it up and does it for you. Then we were able to um, really touch those lives a little bit more than maybe we had a lot of people coming here, but they were just kind of flowing through and getting um, a different kind of experience than what we wanted to provide. So this was a really cool way for us to kind of change our focus and um, I thought another really cool thing was that nobody really said, hey, well, our kids aren't getting anything. Like, everybody here was so willing to change gears, and we were still able to give the kids who come to church here a really cool experience on Easter morning, um, and they were able to hunt eggs in the outdoor chapel and really enjoyed that as well. So it was kind of a great example of ways that we can take something we're doing that is successful and um, still say it's successful, but it's not really fulfilling the mission of sharing Christ's love the way that we intend to. So we're going to change our focus a little bit, and we're going to analyze each and everything we do um, to make sure we're fulfilling our mission as we go along. Why would you stop an event that's bringing in 600 people on your campus? Most people looking on would say, that's crazy. You just don't want to do that. But if that ministry is not in alignment with your mission and your vision, then you are expending an awful lot of energy that is not kingdom building energy. It's just not kingdom building. And we all have a capacity for so much energy. I want the very best of my energy to go to fruitfulness in the kingdom. And so there are three things, as, as I'll break you out in groups, there are three things that you need to just sear into your soul. In this process, you need to have accountability. You need to understand that, that you are accountable, that we are accountable to one another, and by far, we are accountable to the vision that God has given us of our preferred future. And everything must align. We must be accountable to that. We also need to take the authority that Jesus has given us to make disciples. I would beg of myself at various seasons of my life, please don't apologize for being a Christian. Please do not apologize for being a Christ follower. Be proud of that and take the authority to go and make disciples. And then we have to have the responsibility. In church, perhaps this is the hardest thing for us, because we want to please. And so it's very hard for us to say, well, we're going to align, 
And as much as you just love that extravaganza that 600 people come into the church, that is not what God is calling to us any longer. We celebrate that ministry. We just want to lift up the roots of that ministry and say this is what God had for us, but God has a new thing. And we're willing to go in a different direction to align and make sure that we are obedient and fruitful. Now, I want to talk to you a minute about attunement. It's not a word uh, that you hear very often. We certainly hear the word alignment, getting things in line to that one destination. But attunement is really about relationship. And so many times we, we look at our ministry plan and we look at alignment about ministry and we really put that on the front burner without relationship. Alignment always has to have attunement. Alignment always has to be relational. It's why we're church, right? It's why God has called us. And so to display alignment, it always has to be in relationship. And it has to have a genuine care for one another. If you are going to change a ministry to align with your mission and vision, please let it hurt you more than it ever hurts anyone else. Please celebrate the legacy of that ministry. Please honor that ministry and then have the courage to say, perhaps we need to go in a new direction. And so these are four questions that I ask of every staff meeting and any council meeting. The first question, because it makes us accountable, is how have you come to know Christ? How are you growing in Christ? How do you know Christ better today than yesterday? And that should be something that we can answer, that yes, I am knowing Christ because I'm struggling. I am knowing Christ because something beautiful just happened in my life. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It matters that we are coming to know the heart of God in a deeper, in a deeper way. And then the second question, how are you making disciples? I'd love to sit down with each one of you and just be able to ask, so how are you making disciples? What do you do in your everyday life that you're out there just planting those seeds, maybe on rocky soil, maybe on fertile soil, maybe on a pathway that the seed's going to get trodden, but what's your participation in laying down those seeds? Corporately, how are we as a church? Do we evaluate ourselves? Do we ask ourselves, so what are we doing corporately to make disciples? How are you growing disciples? And then, how are you developing leaders who then make and grow disciples? Do you hear discipleship pathway in these questions? Power of the story is absolutely huge here because story supports alignment. When you are working towards alignment, story should also be that foundational piece in which you align or realign. It is critical that you have story. When I first came to the church, there was a habit and a custom that when a bill could not be paid, you know this story, right? Someone would get up and they would stand in front of the church and they would say, folks, we're having a little challenging month here. And so if you could all just dig deep because we really want to keep the lights on. Now that's story. But it's negative story. And so what we decided is we would never ever again share any negative stories. But we were going to share stories. We were going to share powerful stories about relationships we would find just the tiniest thing. And folks, I understand it. It might be that you really have to search for a tiny thing. But that tiny thing in God's hands, well, that can just be huge. And you just start sharing those tiny stories, and someone will come to you, and they'll say, hey, Pastor Jan, I want, I want to tell you what happened at the gas station. I, I was just I was amazed. And you say to them, can I share that story? In fact, better yet, would you share that story? You build on the premise of sharing God's story and God's activity. And again, I will guarantee you that you will find fruitfulness in your church. 
People want to know how you discover Jesus. They want to know how each other discovers Jesus because that's how the body is encouraged and grows. And story supports the why. And so one day I came and I, I stood in front of the church and I have to tell you, we have orange carpet. And it's bad. Oh, it's bad. Orange isn't my favorite color anyways, but this particular orange carpet that goes all the way through the church is threadbare. And the vacuum, you have this carpet, the vacuum grabs a hold of one of those threads and you lose about two more inches of carpet. And I stood in front of the church and I said, folks, came time for offering because story always should be in the offering. Why? Why are you asking me to put something in the plate? The why, the why, the why. And so I stood in front of the church and I said, church, I, I just, I want you to just look down. You see orange carpet. And, and I'm here to tell you that that carpet is just bad. And we're just hoping someday that we're going to replace it. But here's the thing. We are focused on changing lives in our community. And if it means that we spend money for this carpet and then we don't have money to go out and do ministry in the community, can I just tell you, I'm okay with the orange carpet. Are you? In six years, I have not had one complaint about the ugly orange carpet. <laughs> but you know what I have? Is people will tell People that come into our church as guests and, and they, they stay and they, they become fully part of the body. And you know what they'll say? Hey, look down at that carpet. It's really ugly, isn't it? But you see, we'd rather take our ministry money and we'd rather invest it in our community. So someday, we're going to get that new carpet. But not today. Not today. Because story begets story. Now, I could have stood up there and I could have lamented. And we pastors are good at that. I could have said, woe be us because we just need carpet. We can't be a church unless we have carpet. And it can't be orange. Any negative story can be transformed into a God story. So now it's your time. I'm going to give you about seven minutes. I would like you to turn to someone that you want to turn to. And I would like for you to just use your, your PowerPoint notes and to name three ministries that are current in your church. Now, please don't do what I would do if I was sitting. I would say, now I'm going to name the three best ministries so I look good. Just name three ministries. You'll have a better time with us if you just kind of nail down three ministries. And then I want you to share with a partner and answer the following questions. Do you know why? those ministries are happening. You might not be in charge of them, but do you know why those ministries are happening? What is the why? And then what's the intended outcome? So, you know, we're just getting together to have a fellowship supper, right? That's a ministry. Well, why are we having a fellowship supper? Well, because we're United Methodist. <laughs> uh, because we want to get together and we want to get to know each other. Do you know each other? Well, sure. Most of us are related. <laughs> so what's the desired outcome? Well, if I have to be honest, it's to have fun. OK. But the next question is, what's your purpose? What's, what's the vision? Are you making and growing disciples in this time of gathering? Oh, we're supposed to do that. Oh. And then, how are you developing leaders to continue the cycle of making disciples? Oh. Oh. Guess we can't have any more fellowship suppers. No, no, no. Not so. But we do have to decide, is that ministry of getting together and eating are we going to align it to our mission and our vision? 
which means some things have to change, correct? Doesn't mean that you have to toss that ministry out and say, well, that's it. You know, I'm sorry you don't like it, but we're not doing it. No, you have to ask some critical questions. So what can we do with this gathering to eat? Wow, okay, you asked that question. Well, we meet in the fellowship hall. Hmm. What if we made, met at the local diner? In fact, what if we divvied up and met in a couple of diners? And gosh, what if we invited some friends to come along? And what if we had a little devotion? And what if we talked about our own lives? Oh, hmm. There are some times, friends, that in ministry and in this understanding, there are some times when we really need the courage to say, this needs to be eliminated. We can't tweak, we can't fashion it, we can't mold it. We just can't shape this to look like ministry in any way, shape, or form. It just has to go. But can I please beg you that when you're articulating that, people will come along if they understand why does it have to go. You tell me why, and I'll be able to make that shift. Many times we say we're just going to eliminate it and we never honor the why. And then the last one is what do we need to birth? We should be birthing all the time. There are places that we have way too many ministries. We have so much going on that we don't do anything well. And so it takes us to a line, and then there's other places where we are just called to birth something. And that's exciting. And so I'm going to ask that you do so. I'm going to pull you back in seven minutes so that we can have some questions from the general population, and then we will be excused to lunch. Good plan? OK, go for it. Be honest. doing? Good. When you're finished, um, if I can give the instructions for the next steps for lunch, that'll maybe help some of the what happens next confusion. Flow? Yeah. Okay. All right, Thank good. You. So whenever you're finished, okay. I'll just be happy And that's to supposed to be at 1215. Yes. Right on the dot. Yes. Thank goodness there's a clock back there. We have, um, I think at one o'clock we start again. Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Transitioning okay? Getting better. Okay. Getting better. That really feels ungrateful, doesn't it? And it's not. The grief was much deeper than I ever imagined. Oh, Kathy. <laughs> when I left my second appointment, so when I left Covenant Law Payment, I um, had been there just for six years, and it was in February that I announced. And quite honestly, every Sunday, I drive. I mean, it wasn't always weepy from the pulpit, but, you know, we would sing something and I'd be, or somebody would say something at the door. And so for months, I grieved for months. And that's a long time. It is. It's a long time. It yeah. is. I, I just feel like I'm coming out of it. I was introduced at Aldersgate, and that was healing for me. Just, like, putting me in the context and just letting them see me and me seeing them. I'm like, okay, this, this was helpful. Um, but it really troubled my spirit. And I was like, Lord, please no. I know this is what I'm supposed to do. I just, and I should know that about myself, that I go deep with people. <sighs> and I'll go deep with Aldersgate. I know exactly. that. Exactly. But, you know, I, it, when I counsel people, I say deep love means deep grief. And I've said it, Kathy, yeah. I'm living it. Yeah. Deep love means deep yeah. grief. And I just have to honor the grief. I was yeah. fighting it for so long. No, no. And it, I thought, appropriate. It is appropriate. I can't. Because when you leave Middlesex, you will never 
be in that same kind of relationship. No, it's over. It's over. You know, so like and it's really we, over because yeah. I've really trained them. Like you're not following me. Yeah. If you want to honor this ministry, don't follow me because that's dishonoring everything that we've done for six years. I think my struggle is I feel like I can't grieve with Middlesex because I'm their pastor and they're grieving. I can't grieve with Aldersgate because I don't want to hear it. They're grieving right. Troy. So I'm like, I'm like, ah, ah, who do I grieve with? So I grieve, but I'm allowing myself just to, just to let deep grief take its course, roll in, roll out. There are probably other pastors who are moving right now. Who? So I'm thinking that Rachel, yes. her own grieving, yes. is leaving after only a few years. Yes, but that grief is deep. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a very real grief. Yeah. And Troy, yes. Who oh my gosh. There for such a long oh my gosh. And, yeah. Yeah. So I taught the education day yeah. for a board of ordained ministry, and probably three quarters of them are moving. And I, I just, I taught out of my own spirit, but we did spiritual disciplines, imaginative prayer, Jesus yeah. prayer, all that. And every one of them shared this grief. And I was like, oh, how did God know way back when, when I was asked to do that, that I would be in here experiencing grief and being able to counsel and help people who are grieving. Yeah. Oh, what a God we have, <laughs> amazing. All right, I'm going to pull these folks back All together. Right. And then when you're ready for me to tell people where to go, <laughs> you can tell them where to go. <laughs> folks, I'm going to ask that you uh, finish up with one last sentence and then wrap it up. I know it's hard. Okay, come back together. Please tell me I haven't lost you. You can make your mouth go closed. No? All right, class. Do I need to clap? It's the teacher in me. It always works. <laughs> All right. I hope that you have had fruitful conversation with one another. Um, I also hope that you are leaving this room uncomfortable. That is my prayer. Because unless we're uncomfortable, nothing changes, correct? So I would just like to take the next couple minutes to field some questions uh, that you would be asking a question that the whole context would be helped in hearing an answer. Any questions? Kevin. Um, right now we have some like ministries that seem to be like really really out there. They aren't quite aligned with like what we're thinking of like a single church, right? And there's something right now that's like it's presenting as a church and it's like this kind of vision of like how do we bring the spirit of the Lord into the life of the small group? So Kevin's question was, they have a community activity that really isn't Christ-centered, but it's an outreach in the community. Yeah, it's just a, like a church. Okay. So um, if I were talking one-on-one -on -one with Kevin, uh, I'm a coach, and so I would say, Kevin, what was the why of that endeavor? There are some times in which a church will do something, and the why is we need to get our name out in the community. We need to be known in the community. And can I tell you, that's perfectly fine. There are some events and some things that we do because that is what we want to attain. Just be honest about it. Don't make it something spiritual and something that's really going to be a disciple maker if it's not. Now, I'd also dare say that most everything we do can be disciple making. So, Kevin, what I would probably suggest is that you take a group from your church and wherever you are in that community doing that outreach, go on a prayer walk. And do it more than once. And do it different times of the week and times of the day. Because I dare say that God is going to break the heart of someone on that team over something that they saw, felt, or heard. And that might be the very beginning of looking at that ministry saying, is there something more? 
Does God want us to go deeper? It doesn't mean we discredit what we're doing, but is God asking us to peel away that onion skin and go a little deeper into the heart of Jesus? Does that help? Other questions? Bless you. So, you know, similar, similar to Kevin, you know, uh, I struggle, or our church struggles with uh, stuff that we do that is, we, there's no measurable outcome as far as how we, you know, move people to a closer relationship with Christ. And uh, so, you know, I'm curious, you're talking about tweaking stuff where I was under the impression uh, you just get rid of it and you do something different. Because I look at a lot, all the man hours that we put into certain things that we could be doing other things that do have measurable results. So I'm curious about your, your comments on something like that instead of just tweaking something. So my answer to tweaking and eliminating is yes and yes. I cannot stand up here and tell you this is what you need to do. This is a process in which you and the Holy Spirit, and your church, is going to discern what is the appropriate path. And sometimes that is. We have, we have looked, we have tried, we have done everything we can to make this ministry fruitful, and it's just not happening. It's time. It's just time. And then there's other times when you could say, if we would just do this, and it's a trial and error. It's okay to try something and have it not work. It's okay. It is more important to say, what have we learned in the process, and how can we apply it to other places in our discipleship pathway. Right. Bob Farr? Thank you. So that's Bob Farr. Get their name. It's a wonderful book. It's an easy read. You could do it in a small group study. Um, it is one of the principles, William, that uh, in our church, as I said, we had an extravaganza. There was nothing wrong with it. But what we realized is so many people were coming onto the campus, we weren't really talking. We weren't getting their name. We weren't seeing them face to face. They weren't seeing us. We weren't seeing them. And so we decided as we prayed about this, and we looked out in our community, that's critical, get to know your community. We had three mobile home parks in our township. And we realized that most of those kids in the mobile home parks probably didn't make it to our extravaganza. And so we were willing to give up 600 people coming to our campus for a woohoo, for us to go to maybe 70 the first year, and children be able to hunt eggs, but we're talking to mom and dad. A week later, talk about, when you do this stuff, God's just going to show up and be so faithful. A week later, we got a note from someone from the mobile home park. Wish I would have brought it with me. The note said this, thank you so much for coming to us. We don't have children that were involved in the egg hunt, but our neighbor, our little neighbor, came over and told us what a wonderful time he had. Thank you for being Christ. That's what it's about, folks. It takes courage. It takes risk. It takes passion. It takes urgency. But if we align, if we align our ministries with the true meaning of discipleship, there won't be enough room in your church or your community for people to proclaim Christ.